Good evening. Welcome to the special edition of ACDC. I'm your host, Anderson Recuperating. Tonight, we investigate the controversy over the origins of birds. Where do they come from? For more on the controversy surrounding the origins of birds, we go now to Baron Franz Napska, a European aristocrat and former head of the Hungarian Geologic Institute. Currently, the Baron maintains an extensive private collection of fossils, along with a male secretary who also serves as his lover. Please welcome the eminent 19th century paleontologist and notorious homosexual, Baron Franz Napska. Welcome to our show, Baron Napska. Dr. Baron, I have a PhD and a title of nobility. You have neither. Proceed. Dr. Baron, currently there are two competing theories of the origin of bird flight. Could you please briefly review and comment on each one? Yes, Anderson. First, there is the trees down theory. This idea proposes that the ancestors of today's birds started off as four-legged feathered animals climbing among the trees. The ability to fly, so the theory goes, came about because these feathered creatures then started gliding down from the branches. A very plausible scenario, but not for birds. You see, in the past, whenever four-legged animals have developed the ability to fly, they end up looking very different from birds. The flying reptiles are one example. Bats are another example. Skin, not feathers, forms the wings. However, these formerly four-legged creatures cannot walk on two feet. Instead, they remain committed to climbing and crawling, their hands still being quite useful. Birds, on the other hand, all get around on two feet. And that is because the ancestor of birds walked on two feet. It sounds like you support the ground up theory. Not so fast, Anderson, not so fast. Yes, the ground up theory contends that running feathered dinosaurs eventually flapped their arms so strongly that they ended up in the air. Birds and dinosaurs have much in common. But the ground up theory has problems too. There are also critical differences between dinosaurs and birds. In particular, there is the configuration of the legs. When a dinosaur walked, it used its entire leg, everything from the hip down. But when a bird walks, it does so very differently. The uppermost leg bone, the femur, remains rigid. Only the parts below move. This change in configuration is something that the ground-up theory fails to account for. But it is a very critical transition in the origin of birds. One must ask, when did these animals stop running like dinosaurs and start walking like birds? Maybe they changed once they got up into the trees. Ugh, oh, Anderson! This is exactly my point. Who needs trees? Why does everyone think birds have to be gliding down from or running up to trees? Tonight, I will discuss the one and only correct theory regarding the origin of bird flight. Mine. Which says? That birds, modern birds, are the result of feathered creatures adapting to life on the water. Not up in the trees, but out on the water. Now then, let us go back 150 million years to the oldest known ancestor of birds, Archaeopteryx. It's more like a dinosaur than a bird. It must have walked like a dinosaur too. Could this animal fly? No. Fossils of this animal are found in rock deposits which formed in tropical lagoons along the seashore. Not a tree in sight. Only a lot of ferns. In this environment, there were many strong ocean breezes, just like on any beach today. Perhaps Archaeopteryx didn't need to flap. Perhaps it simply spread its arms and the wind lifted it up. Not very high, but high enough. This differentiated it from all other two-legged dinosaurs. Now, let's move forward in time. The next type of ancient bird we find is a Confucius bird, so named because it is found only in China. This is the first bird ancestor with a short tail. But this tail is not like a modern bird's tail. Modern birds can flex the feathers on their tail. The Confucius bird could not. 
More significantly, these creatures were poor flyers. Their wings were not strong enough to flap like today's birds. Look at their claws and legs. These creatures spent a good deal of time in the trees, climbing, gliding, and fluttering perhaps, but not flying. They are at best an interesting side branch of bird development. Now then, let us move on to the next type of ancient bird we find, the opposite birds. So named because the configuration of the bones in their shoulders is the opposite of today's birds. The shoulder bones of today's birds look like this. The shoulder bones of the opposite birds look like this. These creatures could fly, but again, not like today's birds. Claws were still important. All opposite birds had them. But such claws did not allow for a nice streamlined wing. They may have gotten up in the air quite nicely, but they could not have swooped like an eagle or a hawk. So, what do these ancient birds tell us? Well, obviously teeth and claws were important, yet despite their being unlike modern birds, particularly when it comes to flying, these creatures were nevertheless highly successful surviving for many, many millions of years all over the world. And then they went extinct with the dinosaurs. Why? Aha! Why, Anderson? Why did they go extinct, but we have modern birds in their place? This is where water comes in. Returning to our survey of bird ancestors, there was another group. Once it was busy adapting to life near the water. Fresh water, rivers, lakes, ponds, and the like. The earliest of these are the intriguing Yan bird and the Yishan bird. The Yan bird is named after the Chinese word for swallow. It was a wader about the size of a pigeon. It had sharp teeth for catching fish. Like today's birds, it ate small stones to help it digest its food. More importantly, it could lift its wings high enough to get a powerful downstroke, the kind necessary for strong, powered flight. This is unlike any ancient bird before it. Then there is the Yishon bird, named after a region in China. This chicken-sized wading bird could fan its feathers in its tail, just like modern birds do. Also, its wings were broad and rounded, unlike the wings of earlier ancient birds. Clearly, this creature also had a better command of the air. But why would such physical features develop in these birds? I will tell you why. You see, a bird on the ground can run to gain the speed it needs to take off. But a bird standing in the water cannot. Its wings alone must be strong enough to provide all the lift it needs. And there is also good reason to believe that these creatures had the beginnings of the modern bird shape. For a two-legged animal foraging in the water, it makes more sense to orient the body so that it's level with the surface of the water. Perhaps this is why the Yishon bird had a flexible fan tail. It could keep its tail high and dry. Otherwise, But such a body, in turn, suggests that these creatures must have started abandoning the dinosaur mode of leg movement. Following the yin bird and the yishon bird, there is a creature who takes these adaptations even further. The pigeon-sized gansus. This creature had webbed feet. So we know it actually swam in the water. This means its body had to have floated comfortably on the water, level, like so. You see, in the floating position, the most efficient way to navigate is to keep the uppermost leg bone, the femur, level and secure with the body while the rest of the leg paddles about. 
But of course, that also means Gansu's legs could not have been anything like a dinosaur's. One more thing. All modern birds have a gland near the tail which provides oil for their feathers. But they are able to reach this gland only because their necks are extremely flexible. Most likely then, the neck of Gansu's was just as flexible. Unfortunately, its head and neck have not been found. So you don't know if Gansu's had teeth? No, but later fossils suggest it did. These are the ancient birds Hesperonus and Ixionus. Both had teeth. Both were water birds, although adapted for life in a marine rather than a freshwater environment. Ixionus floated and paddled about on the ocean. Meanwhile, Hesperonus swam underwater, vigorously kicking its feet. Such creatures would not have been possible without an ancestor like Gansus. Obviously, the legs of these birds were nothing like a dinosaur's. Dr. Barron. These later water birds with teeth became extinct as well. Why did birds without teeth survive? Well, Anderson, when one looks at the Great Extinction 65 million years ago, a curious pattern emerges. Survivors all had one thing in common. They lived in a freshwater environment. We're not sure why this is the case. But if so, then it makes sense that the birds associated with fresh water would have likely been survivors as well. The ability to fly may have mattered little. But you still haven't explained why birds without teeth survived. Ah, let us look closer at possible bird survivors and their environments. Although teeth were certainly handy in the freshwater environment, there are other creatures who don't need teeth. These are the filter feeders. They use beaks to strain food from water and mud. And that is the last piece of this paleontological puzzle. Anderson, all modern birds have beaks because they are descended from a filter feeding ancestor, a creature who, in turn, was a descendant of an ancient bird adapted for life in and around fresh water. The bodies of all modern birds bear the evidence of this water bird ancestry. Of course, many have since adapted to function as needed. Beaks and feet have become lethal weapons. The flexible tail can serve as a sexual display. Even wings have been transformed into fins. According to your scenario then, chickens and other flightless birds are descendants of flying water birds. Why would a bird abandon flight? Well, Anderson, it may be the other way around. Perhaps flight abandon them. Consider, even today there are birds who molt and temporarily lose all capacity for flight. This is exactly the case with the tundra swan during breeding season. Perhaps in the past, some water birds molted away their flight feathers only to find later that they were perfectly content to remain flightless. So Anderson, who needs trees? Think of it. The closest sound we may have today to that of a dinosaur may be the quack of a duck. Cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, 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 cold.